My name is Julia Butterfly Hill. Where did you get the name Butterfly? I got the name Butterfly when I was hiking in the mountains in Pennsylvania, and a butterfly landed on me and stayed on me for hours while I was hiking. <laughs> and it would go from like my shoulder to my head to my hand, but stayed on me the whole time I was hiking. I was about seven and a half years old or so, and stayed on me all the way till I got home, and it's been a part of my name ever since. Who inspired you to do this? I'm really inspired by the everyday people. We live in a society that's all about like the movie stars and the celebrities and we want the big flashy everything. And I think as a result of that, we kind of miss all the amazing things that are really happening in our world and we miss the amazing people that are in our own communities. So I tend to be very inspired by young people, by teachers, by community organizers, by people who just see a need in their community or in the world and do something to make a difference. That's what makes me feel like I'm part of a bigger team that really cares and that, that excites me. Who's your role model? Nature's actually my role model. I figure nature's been evolving for billions of years. It's probably figured a few things out along the way. The trees taught me the lesson of when they go through a storm, that if a tree or a branch is too rigid, it's what breaks in the storm. The trees that stay rooted in their commitment, reaching towards their vision, but flexible with the storms, they're the ones that make it through. Were you afraid? I was afraid all the time, girl. <laughs> I'm a human being, right? Like, I, I cry when I'm sad. I say things I regret when I'm angry. I freak out. I get afraid, you know, all those things. I, I went through the worst winter in recorded history of California. The winds went up to 90 miles an hour. I was on a four by six piece of scrap wood. My roof and walls were made from plastic tarps, and I was 18 stories up in the worst storms in recorded history. I, the company literally tried to kill me. They shot guns at me, they cut trees at me, they hovered a twin propeller helicopter with 300 mile an hour winds underneath it, 75 feet above my head. They cut off my food and supplies trying to starve me down. They blew air horns all night and all day for eight days so I couldn't sleep, trying to sleep deprive me down. There were so many times that I was frightened out of my mind up there. But what I have found in my life is that when we care enough about something, we don't let fear stop us. It doesn't mean that we are not afraid, but it just means that we don't let fear keep us from doing what we believe in. How do you handle personal hygiene at the day? I gathered water from the sky. The redwoods are a part of the temperate rainforest. So people think about rainforest in South America, but they don't realize we have rainforest in the United States. So the temperate rainforest, even if it's not raining, there's lots of fog and there's lots of water in that fog. So I created a system where I gathered water from the sky, from the rain and from the fog. So I used that water to cook, to clean, to drink with. I had a little pot with a handle that was both my light and my, my bathing and clothes washing <laughs> all in one. So I had my light was candles and the wind would blow out the candles. So I would put the candle in the little pot it would reflect the light and keep the wind from blowing out the candle. And then when I needed to bathe or wash my clothes, I would heat up the water in that and sponge bath and hang my head over the platform and dump water on it. And very, very simple living. But the reality is there's people all over the world who live very, very simply. We take for granted turning on a faucet and having water come out. It doesn't happen all over the world. How long were you in the tree again? I was in the tree for 738 days, which is two years and eight days. How did you feel when you parted ways with the tree? I felt so many emotions because really that tree had become like my best friend. I didn't leave it for over two years. It was just me and this tree. Uh, it also became a powerful teacher for me. I learned so much by sitting in that one place with that one living being day in and day out. So part of me was sad to be leaving and part of me was afraid. Again, the fear issue of I went up in that tree, one person I was coming down really changed. And I was also coming down to an entire world that now watches me. And then it got to the point where people, I was getting up to like 600 letters a week and doing my best to answer all of them. And um, the most I was doing, I was literally handwriting 400 letters a week. How do you get them? I had a ground support team who brought up my food and supplies and would pack out my waste and a huge part of my team, they'd hike up the media that kind of thing. They were such a crucial part of my team and they would also bring up the mail. When it got to the point where it was that many, 
for all of our sakes, I said, don't keep bringing it all up. Like, read it on the ground, look for the things that seem really important, and send me those. So any letter that came from a young person, they would bring up. Because I, growing up, I didn't have any examples of who I wanted to be as a person. And if a young person reaches out to me and says, something about your life is interesting, even if they don't agree with everything, that's OK. But if a young person finds my life or my story interesting, I wanted to reach out to young people because I didn't have that growing up. I had prisoners who would write me. I wrote to all of them. A lot of people who are in prison aren't bad people. They've made a mistake, and now they've ended up in a pretty terrible system. And because I was living on a four by six in a kind of jail of my own, it inspired many people who were in prison who were at their heart good people and wanting to make a difference in the world, so I wrote them. But yeah, I got to the point where I, I brought it back down to about 100 letters a week because I couldn't actually do <laughs> everything there was to do. And then there was also just the joy that we had done it. We had saved the tree that I was in and the grove around it, which is why I was able to come down, because we'd won. And it had never happened before in our movement that a tree sit had won the protection of a grove. And we had, not only me, but my team, we had all given so much of our lives to to this action and to have a victory was really extraordinary. So it was kind of a roller coaster of emotions. What do you miss most often we, from when you was in the tree? You know what's funny is that question. Because when I first climbed the tree, everybody asked, what do you miss most about being on the ground? <laughs> <laughs> and then I came down on the ground and everybody says, what do you miss about being in the tree? And what's interesting about that is I learned a really powerful lesson about our society with those questions because we've been tricked into missing things instead of appreciating them. You know, we take so much for granted, and I did too, until I lived on a four by six platform. My entire life was on four by six, <laughs> 18 stories up in a thousand year old tree on the top of a mountain. And I realized how much I took for granted in my life. And that when we miss things, it's because we're not actually appreciating the moment. Like, why should I waste my time missing something when I have so much to be appreciative for and grateful for right now? And as a result of that, my life is so much better because I can find joy in the small thing. We live in a time now in our society where you need the latest outfit or you need the coolest car or you need the latest magazine with the celebrities or like it's all not that any of that's wrong in and of itself but we have this society now that makes us want something other than who we are and what we already have and as a result i think we miss how amazing our lives really are do you have any regrets for doing this i do not live my life with regrets i feel like the only time regrets are regrets are if you don't learn from something if you make a mistake and you don't learn from it, then there's something to regret because you're going to have to go through that mistake again. <laughs> but if you look at a mistake as a learning opportunity, then there's nothing to regret because that's part of how we learn. From the time we're babies, you know, when you try and stand up and walk, you fall over. And you don't judge yourself because you made the mistake and didn't walk on your first try. You just keep trying until one day you're walking. But then we grow up and then we, th we get somehow taught in our minds that making a mistake is a really bad, terrible thing. And it's, I don't feel that it is. If we go, okay, what did I try that didn't work? Why didn't it work? How can I learn from that and, and do better the next time? It actually has helped me become the person I've become. So any mistake that I've made, I've done my best to learn from it and become a better person for it. And giving my life to something I believe in, I will never regret that. What I do know is that I'm committed to having my life, to the best that I can, make a positive difference in the world for the animals, for the people, for the planet. And wherever that commitment takes me, I'm, I'm willing to follow it. It's great to meet Thank you, you too. Thanks so much for taking the time and for asking these questions.